Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for our Bible study. Thank you for the love and the interest you give every one of us for the study of your word. We're praying that as we study the word, your grace will be abundant in our lives in Jesus' name. And we pray that the strength will be obedient to your word you grant unto everyone. Open our eyes of understanding tonight. Help us to understand what you want us to know. So that as we know this, through that knowledge, we live the life we ought to live. In Jesus' name, we pray. Already we just finished the first epistle of Peter. And we're now coming to the second epistle of Peter. So we're starting from chapter 1 of the second epistle of Peter today. This second epistle of Peter is a companion of the epistle to the, of the first epistle to the Christians in Asia Minor. The first epistle was written to those who are suffering. They were suffering persecution. They live in a hostile environment. And so Peter needed to make them understand how to have hope in the Lord, how to live in holiness, and how to be in harmony in that hostile environment. In that first epistle, he was calling them to steadfastness in spite of persecution from outside the church. From the beginning or between the first and the second epistles, there was a change of circumstances. The danger was no more fairy persecution from outside the church. The danger was now false prophets from within the church. And so he wrote this second epistle. Warning the believers of false prophets and false teachers. If you look at second at the second chapter in verse one, it says, But there are false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And so you see the danger that was there at that time. Even in chapter 3, in chapter 3, verse 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days coffers, walking after their own lost, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? From those texts you will see the danger they had at that time. It was a danger of false prophets and false teachers. Under such circumstances, in order to teach them how to stay steadfast in the faith, how to know the word of God, so that nobody will be able to move them out of the concept, out of the doctrine, out of the teaching of the scriptures. Not only that, he knew that his life will soon come to an end. The Lord has showed him, as we read in chapter 1, chapter 1, verse 13. Yea. I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ assured me, because he knew the shortness of time that he had on earth, and he also knew that the Lord will be coming very soon. He needed to call the believers to holiness of heart, and holiness of life. As you look at this second epistle, you'll find many references to righteousness and godliness. You'll find it talks about being holy. And he uses the word holy a number of times. Look at how he refers to righteousness, how he refers to godliness. He did that in chapter 1, in chapter 2, as well as in chapter 3, in chapter 1. He tells us in verse 6, And to know and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness. He was calling the people to holiness, righteousness, and godliness. In chapter 2, look at verse 5, And he spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness. And then in chapter 3, verse 11, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be? In all holy conversation and godliness. Verse 14, Wherefore, beloved, 
seeing that he look for such things. Be diligent that she may be found of him in peace, without spot and without blame. Blameless. And so as you look at the whole epistle, you will see the emphasis and the focus of the apostle, calling them to holiness, calling them to righteousness and godliness. The Holy Spirit moved upon holy men, he said, to preach and prophesy. In the Old Testament, we are now called to obey the Holy Commandment, from which backsliders are turned away. He reminds the people that nothing short of holy conversation and godliness can prepare us for the future final day of God. We are looking at verses 1 to 4 today, and we are dividing the verses into three parts. The three parts to the study. Number one, gracious pardon through the Savior. Gracious pardon through the Savior. Chapter two. God, uh, number two, God's power and his sufficiency. God's power and his sufficiency. Then number three, great promises and our sanctification. We go to point number one in Second Peter chapter one, verses one and two. Simon Peter is servant and, and, and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Here Peter wrote to the believers and as he was writing to the believers, he wanted them to know of the gracious pardon the conversion, the salvation that was made available to everyone. But to see the way he introduces himself, he introduces himself as a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Those words are very important. But please understand, before we can become servants of the Lord, we must become children of God, sons of God. These were the people that the Lord had called to himself. And by grace, they were saved. They had faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. As many as received him, he gave them power to become the sons of God, even to the people that believed on his name. And being children of God, sons of God, now they could work for God. First of all, a member, and then a minister. First of all, a follower, and then a soul winner. First of all, a member of the family of God, and then a leader over the flock of God. And then as he describes himself, he uses uh, these two terms that are very important. Number one, he said, I'm a servant. A servant of Jesus Christ. Number two, he said, I am an apostle. An apostle of Jesus Christ. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. I want you to have these words in mind. When we talk of servant, we talk of submission. A servant submits. When we talk of an apostle, we're talking of an ambassador. Apostle, ambassador, sent forth to represent the one that sent him. But you see the order of the use of the word. Number one, a servant. Because you have this attitude of submitting to the Lord, of being faithful to the Lord, of being loyal to the Lord, of saying, yes, Lord, you are my Lord, you are my king. You have authority over me. I am under authority. Because I'm under authority, I can go out as an ambassador, as an apostle. And then as an ambassador, as an apostle, I can speak with authority for the king and for the Lord, for the master who has sent me. That's what we need to understand. All of us, one way or the other, we are servants of the Lord. And as servants of the Lord, you submit to the authority of the Lord. You are telling the Lord, oh yes, I belong to you. Your will will be my will. Your way will be my way. Not as I will, but I will be done. Not what I want to do or where I want to go, but I will do what you want me to do. You bid me stay or go. That will be wonderful for me. But then he told them something. As an ambassador, an apostle, a servant of the Lord, talking to them from the Lord, he said to them that have obtained like precious faith. He's talking about saving faith. The faith, the arch in the Lord that made them to be born again. The faith that brought them forgiveness of their sins. The faith that made them adopted, to be adopted into the family of God. In Romans chapter 3, 
reading there from verse 22. You'll see here the emphasis of faith. Or oh, righteous now we're made righteous. How do we become righteous in the Lord? By having faith in Christ. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. No difference between the Jews and the Greeks. No difference between one sinner and the other sinner. Whatever the background, there is no difference. Once you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are brought into the family of God, and then your sins are forgiven. The righteousness of the Lord is imputed unto you. In verse 24, be justified freely by grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Faith in his blood. That means, you know, he died for you. That means, you know, he was your substitute. That means, you know, all your sins have been carried away by the Lord Jesus Christ. And you believe that blood that was shed for you. And you have redemption through his blood. He tells us there, through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness. For the remission, that means removal, the pardon, the forgiveness of sins. That are passed through the forbearance of God. He tells us then, we come into this grace. We come into this privilege by believing on the Lord. And uh, Peter had the experience, Paul had the experience. All those children of God in New Testament times, they had the experience. And if you are going to be in good relationship with the Lord today, you need the experience as well. In First Timothy chapter 1, First Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Then he goes back to what he used to be. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And then he says, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love. Which is in Christ Jesus. And you see the moment he mentions grace, he mentions faith. On the side of God, it is grace. On the side of God, it's love and mercy. On the side of God, he planned salvation. We didn't merit it. On our side, there is a hand of faith reaching out to receive what the Lord had provided on the cross of Calvary. And then it says, reading through in that place, it says in verse 15, this is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. He said, I'm the greatest of them all, and yet he saved me. How be it? You need to understand this, for this purpose, for this reason, for this cause, I obtain mercy, that in me first, Jesus Christ must show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them, which should hereafter believe on him, to life everlasting. He says, uh, salvation did not stop with him. Showing mercy from the Lord did not stop with him. That the people that will hereafter believe, the same privilege is given unto them. They too, they can believe. Come back to Second Peter chapter 1. I'm reading verse 1, Simon Peter. A servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us. It says, um, if you are born again, you might be a Gentile. We might be Jews. Those who have received, those Gentiles, they have received the same like precious faith, like we are. The same salvation, the same adoption into the family of God, and the same privilege that those Jews receive, the same privilege we receive as well. There is no difference in their salvation and our salvation, whether Jew or Gentile, whether religious or irreligious, before you came to the Lord, it is the same grace, it's the same pardon, it's the same sin. We come into the kingdom of God. But then he tells us now how we came into that kingdom of God was still in verse one through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. It says it's through the righteousness of God. This is the plan of God. This is something that God did himself. We're justified by faith. Our sins are forgiven because of the plan of salvation. It is not something orig originating from us. It originated from the Lord. In uh, Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Verses 1 and 2. Therefore, being justified by faith, we are peace with God. 
through our Lord Jesus Christ. We were separated from the Lord, but now we are reconciled with the Lord. We have a good relationship with the Lord now. We are justified by faith and we have peace with Him. There is no controversy between a child of God and God anymore. Because there is no enmity, the enmity is cancelled. The carnal mind is cancelled. We have peace with God. And it is through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also, referring to Jesus, by Him we have this access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Please come back to uh, for Second Peter chapter 1. He has told us now who he was writing to the people. And he has told us the people he was writing to. The people that were born again. The people that were saved. That tells us something. That we are born again is not the end of a uh, testing of the grace of God. You are born again. You become a member of the family of God. You need to be feeding on the watch of God. You need to be praying unto the Lord as well. Because you need more grace. You need the peace of God. What you have received is just the initial favor of the Lord. The Lord wants to continue in your life. Come now to verse 2. In verse 2 it says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. It says there are two things there. Number one, grace. Number two, peace. On the first hand, it says grace be multiplied unto you. How are we going to grow in grace? How are we going to have more grace given unto us? How will grace be multiplied through the knowledge of God? When you, when you come to study the word of God, you know more of the love of God more of the attributes of God, more of the nature of God, more of the plan of God, more of what the Lord has made available for you and for me through that knowledge of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, what Jesus did and the meaning and the provision of the cross and Calvary for you. Through that knowledge, grace is multiplied. And then it says on the second part, peace be multiplied unto you. Wait a minute. Grace multiplied unto you. Peace multiplied unto you. What does that mean? Very clearly then it means that the grace we receive when we are born again. That's not the extent or the scope or the highest level of grace. There is still more. In fact, as the Bible talks about grace, a turn which you mean not to the Bible, in Romans chapter 3 again. Romans chapter 3 verse 24. It says, Be justified freely by his grace. There is just grace. There, there is no qualification there. It's just grace. The riches of God at Christ's expense is made available unto you. But then as you read the Bible, it says that's not the end. Don't go away yet because there is more grace. In uh, James, I'm reading James chapter 4. In James chapter 4, reading there in verse 6. Here he tells us in verse 6, but he giveth more grace. You understand then why Peter said, grace be multiplied unto you, because there is grace. Not only that there is grace, there is more grace. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 4, Acts chapter 4, reading verse 33. Here it's talking about the early church, as they prayed, and then they were now to receive more from the Lord in Acts chapter 4, reading verse 33. And great and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. You know what the Lord is telling us? There is grace, there is more grace and there is great grace. That's why the apostle was saying grace be multiplied unto you. When you are born again, you have grace. And then in your life, many circumstances will come. And as those circumstances come, you'll need more grace. And God says, come. You'll need great grace sometimes. And God says, come. In Second Corinthians chapter 12, Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. There is sufficient grace. There's grace, there's more grace, there's great grace, there's sufficient grace. That's why Peter said, the level you have got now, you can get more. Because grace is not just that a little thing that you have got, there is more you can still get from the Lord. In Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, 
verse 17. In Romans 5, 17, we have another qualification of grace. That is, another sin, another word that qualifies grace for us. It says, for ye by one man's offense, that's reigned by one. Much more, they that receive abundance of grace. Abundance of grace. And the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. It says there's abundant grace as well. And it doesn't even stop there. It tells us in Second Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. It tells us still about the grace of God. And uh, how more grace will be available in Second Corinthians chapter 9. Reading there from verse 14. In verse 14, he tells us about uh, this grace. It says, And by their prayer for you, which long after you for the exceeding grace of God in you. Exceeding grace of God in you. And then in verse 8 of that same chapter, it says, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always have in all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. That's why when Peter was writing to those believers, he said, whatever level you may be, and whatever it is you may need, understand there is grace, there is more grace, there is great grace, there is sufficient grace, there is abundant grace, there is exceeding grace, and there is all grace. And at whatever level you are, you can come to the throne of grace that you may demand, that you may ask, and obtain mercy to find a help in the time of need. But then uh, Peter did not only speak about grace being multiplied. He also said, peace be multiplied unto you. As we talk about the peace of God, and it says, peace be multiplied with you. Already we know that when we are born again, we have the peace of God. Because it says, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. God. But again, Peter is telling us that just the initial thing, because the peace of God can be more than what you have got. It tells us in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. He said, you have been born again. Therefore, you are justified by faith. You have peace with God. But then let that peace, let it continue to rule in your heart. And then in Psalm 119, Psalm 119, I'm reading verse 165. Psalm 119, verse 165. Here it says, Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. There is peace, and there is great peace. That's why it says, the peace of God also be multiplied. You have the initial sin, which is peace, and then there is the possibility of having great peace. In Isaiah chapter 66, Isaiah chapter 66, verse 12. In verse 12, it says, For thus says the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river. Like a river, it will be overflowing its boundary. That means then the peace of God will be so much in your life that it's not just that you have peace, it's not just that you have great peace, you have peace flowing like a river, very deep and uh, very quiet as well. In Jeremiah chapter 33, Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 6 Behold, I will bring it health and cure, I will cure him and will reveal unto them the abundance of peace. Abundance of peace and truth. That means then, uh, you have peace when you are born again. But then you can move on and have great peace. Then you can have peace like a river. And then you can even have abundant peace. And then in uh, Philippians chapter 4, Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding. It is that peace of God that is so deep and so high, so great and so permanent that it even passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Uh, come back to Second Peter. Uh, that's why Peter was telling the people, he said, do not uh, limit whatever you have got from the Lord. 
be it grace, be it peace, or any other sin, that grace can be multiplied. And that peace can be multiplied. Simon Peter, a servant submissive to the Lord, an apostle and ambassador of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith, the same faith saving faith with us who are Jews, with us who saw the Lord face to face, even those who have not seen the Lord face to face, they have the same faith. And it says, it is through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ grace, the grace of God and peace, the peace coming from God be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. Now, you see there are many people, they do not have this abundant uh, grace, or they do not have the experience and the enjoyment of that grace of God and the peace of God. And you say, why? It's because they do not have the knowledge they ought to have. Because it's the, the more you grow in the knowledge of the Lord, the more you grow in grace. The more you grow in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, the more your peace will increase. And then the disturbances and the confusion and everything that the conflict within, all that will pass away the more you know about God the Father and God the Son. We come to point number two. In point number two, we have God's power and his sufficiency. In Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says, According to his divine power, he has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. And you will see the emphasis of Peter. In fact, you see the reason why I was writing to the believers. There are some believers, they play with Bible study. They play with the study of the Word of God. Personal study and then corporate study like this as we're together. And that's why you find many of such people, they do not grow. They do not grow in their faith. They do not grow in grace. They do not grow in the enjoyment, the experience of the peace of God. Because he tells us in verse 1, it says through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. He tells us in verse 2, through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. He tells us in verse 3, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue. Which means, in every verse uh, at the beginning of the epistle, it says, yes, you can grow in the Lord. Yes, you can enjoy your experience and relationship with the Lord. But it comes through knowledge. Knowledge of the Word. You study the Word, and it is a study of the Word. The more you study the Word, the more you grow in the Lord. It is a backbone of the believer, and the backbone of the church as well. That's why, as a church, we do not joke with our regular weekly Bible study. And that's why, as a single, as an individual believer, you must not play with the study of the Word of God. Because what you have is sufficiency of the provision of the Lord for spiritual life and your other areas of life. It is through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and to virtue. But look at the verse itself. According as His divine power, He has given unto us all things. All things that pertain unto life and godliness and it is a lot there it tells us that he has divine power that is the power that created the whole universe that's the power that traced jesus from the dead and that's the power that can recreate man and make man what man ought to be and as we look at that power there is no limit to the things that divine power can do that's why it says according to that divine power According to that omnipotent power. According to that all sufficient power. According to that power that has no limit. According to that power that works and there is no limit in time. And there is no limit in accomplishment. He has given unto us all things. All things pertaining to life eternal. All things pertaining to godliness. When it says all things, it divides that into two areas. It says think about life. That's eternal life. Think about life. That's about our salvation. Think about life. That's about our forgiveness, our cleansing, our conversion, our transformation, righteousness, and new life. All things pertaining to that new life, that adoption into the life of God, He has given unto us. Not only that, it says all things pertaining to godliness. It says when you think of the deeper things of God, and you are thinking of godliness, and you are thinking of godly nature, and you are thinking of the godly life. And you are thinking of having a God-fearing attitude, a purified heart, sanctification, or holiness, or inner purity, or having the whole mind of Christ. He's given us that too. He has given us 
all things pertaining unto godliness. Look at the Bible and see how a God has made that available. In Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Reading from verse 18. It tells us there the provision of the Lord, the depth and the height of how the Lord has gone in making this provision for us that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened that ye may know what is that, what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding, uh, exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Here uh, the apostle P uh, Paul was praying for the believers in Ephesus. And he said he was praying for them. If you go back to verse 15, verse 16, you'll see that he was praying for them. And he was praying for them that their eyes will be so open. And they will be enlightened. And they will know. The height and the breadth and the length, the riches of the glory that God has provided for them as says that they can have as inheritance. Then he told them what the, the greatness of the power of the Lord, walking mightily within them. And then he says the measure of that power is what he did when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead. In Ephesians chapter 3, still talking about what the Lord can do and what the Lord wants to do. It says from verse 17 that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That ye being rooted and grounded in love. May be able to comprehend with all saints. What is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height. And to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. That ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. You see what we are talking about? And you know what uh, Peter was praying about? And what he was talking about? That according to his divine power, he has given us all things pertaining to life, all things pertaining to godliness. Here Paul mentions the same thing in a different way. He says Christ will dwell in your heart by faith. You are already born again. Christ was already there. But he wanted them to experience more of the power, the divine power. And then that they will be rooted and grounded in love. They already had the love. But he wanted something more. In fact, he said he wanted them to understand. Not understand mentally. Understand in the head. Understand as we understand uh, empirical knowledge or historic knowledge. But ex experiential. They will know it with all the saints. Then he says the breadth and the length and the depth and the height. And that they will know more of the love of Christ. The kind of love that passes understanding and passes knowledge that they might be filled not just filled with god filled with the fullness of god filled with all the fullness of god and then he now tells us in verse 20 that you may think that's impossible you may be wondering how will that be done he says now to him that's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us he said when i said you can be filled with all the fullness of god it's according to the power that worketh in us and it can do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask and seek and then he didn't intend until he gave glory to the lord unto him be glory in the church by christ jesus throughout all ages world without end which means all those things are still available even until our time today if you are wondering but with man isn't that a difficult thing with man isn't that uh, something uh, that, that seems even impossible yes it might seem impossible to man but then jesus tells us in matthew chapter 19 matthew chapter 19 reading from verse 26 but jesus beheld them and said unto them with men this is impossible to be filled with the fullness of god with men this is impossible for the grace of god and the peace of god to be multiplied unto you and that grace and that peace passes understanding with men this is impossible and to have all things pertaining to life pertaining to life eternal for you to have that salvation that sets you free from sin and there is no stain and there is no shadow of sin at all and you are totally cleansed and completely converted and your life is totally new with men this is impossible and when you think about having all things 
pertaining unto godliness that you'll be sanctified you'll be made holy you'll be purified pure within and without with men this is impossible but with god all things are possible that's why peter said i'm not telling you to have that eternal life in your own strength i'm not telling you to have the fullness of god all in your own strength i'm not telling you to have i'm not telling you to possess everything pertaining to godliness all in your own strength it's according to the divine power that he has given unto us all these things pertaining to life and pertaining to godliness he tells us in romans chapter 8 Romans chapter 8, how the Lord has done it. And if he gave us uh, the, the, the first deposit, if he gave us the salvation, the initial experience, how much more will he not give us every other thing that still remains in Romans chapter 8 verse 32? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things, remember all things, all things pertaining to life eternal. All things connected with life eternal. Make me a new creature, living a new life. All things passing away, all things becoming new. Living like a child of God. All the old sins and the besetting sin, everything taken away. And you live in purity and holiness of life. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things, all things pertaining to sanctification. All things pertaining to a life that is deep and rooted in the love of God. All things pertaining to pleasing God. That God will look at your life, will look within and look without. He will be pleased with your life. How much more will he give us all things since he has given us the Lord Jesus Christ? Is the emphasis of uh, the Holy Spirit through Peter and through Paul and through all the others in the Bible that according to that divine power. The power that created the world, the power that raised Christ from the dead, and the power that's able to do anything, and the power that is able to even bind the devil and throw him in the bottomless pit, that power is so great, then it's able to give us righteousness and all that he has promised in the world. In Titus chapter 2, Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. And you'll see the emphasis of Paul as well as the emphasis of Peter. He said to them that have received like precious faith as we, like us. That means the Gentiles and the Jews. That means the people that didn't see the Lord face to face. And the people that saw the Lord face to face. That means everybody on earth in every nation. And it's the same emphasis here. The grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. All men. Everyone. Then it says he's teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws. We should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Have you noticed something in the Bible? Have you noticed some repetition? Repetition, but using different words so that if you meet it on the first word, you'll get it on the second word. Uh, the Bible wants to emphasize that we should live a godly life, a righteous life, a pure life, and a holy life. Instead of just using one word, it says we should live soberly. And that might have been enough. It says righteously. That might be all right. It says godly. Unless you miss it and you think that holiness is only, can only be practiced in heaven. It says in this present world. And that's the grace of God. That's what the Lord has provided. And if we really know the Lord, that's what we're going to experience. In verse 14 it says who gave himself for us. That he might redeem us from all iniquity. You, you know many believers today. So-called believers, they do not understand the word of God anymore. And they are not free from all iniquity. But the Bible says that he might redeem us from all iniquity. And if he redeems us from all iniquity, no iniquity will be there anymore. Your life will be clean. Outward sins will not be there. Inward sins will not be there. You will be pure within and without. You will be righteous and holy. It says he will. Redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. And uh, the, the zeal is what the Lord himself produces. It's not something we have to drag and push you before you become zealous for the Lord. When that grace of God comes in your life, you'll find that that zeal will be there. In First Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians 
chapter 2 in verse 12. First Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 12. That ye would walk worthy of God who has called you unto his kingdom and glory. Come back to Second Peter chapter 1. In Second Peter chapter 1, reading there in verse 3 again. In verse 3 it says, according as his divine power. He has given unto us all things. All things that pertain unto life and godliness. And now you are wondering, why is it then? We see many people that go to church, evangelical, Pentecostal churches, even our church too. We see many people that read the Bible a little. We see many people that claim to be born again. But this holiness we are talking about, this righteousness we are talking about, is not in their lives. You say why? It tells us there, look at it, in verse 3, through the knowledge of him. That called, that has called us to glory and to virtue through the knowledge. It's as we go to the word of God and we see the purpose of our salvation is to be saved from sin. You'll call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. When we see that purpose, when we see the mission of Christ, when we see the power of God, when we see what he can do. And when we see what he has done for others, when we see the promise of God, when we see how far the blood of the Lamb can wash and make us clean, that will wash me and make me whiter than snow. When you see what the power of the blood of the Lamb can accomplish in your life, it is through that knowledge, the knowledge of him that called us to glory and to virtue. When you know the calling of the Lord. And you know that you are not just called to the church. And there are some people that feel that once I'm in the church, I've done the greatest thing I can do. I'll be called into the church. It's more than that. You are called to glory. You are called to virtue. And you are called to a life, a life that will bring glory to God. A virtuous life. You, you know your calling. You know that you are called. You are called to be in Christ. And you are called to be in the family of God. And you are called to share the glory of the kingdom. And you are called to have the virtue of Christ. Christ at virtue. And the virtue of Christ coming in your life. That's the very purpose why you are called. It is that time the power of the Lord will totally transform you. It's that time when you think about it. When you focus on it. When you pray about it. When you desire it. When you read it again and again. And you say, Lord, this that you have given me in your word, I want it for myself. It's then it will sanctify you. It's then you will have an effectual experience with the Lord. You know it, you recognize it, you believe the work of Christ on Calvary. It is that knowledge. It is that intimate relationship. It is that passionate desire in the acquaintance you have with the Lord. That now I'm called to glory, I must see that glory in my life. I'm called to virtue, I must see that virtue in my life. It is then you'll be able to have what the Lord has provided for you through his death on the cross of Calvary. We come to point number three, great promises and our sanctification. Great promises and our sanctification. In first in second Peter chapter one, verse four, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these, that is, by these promises, ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through laws. Here he tells us, he said, believers, know you understand the calling that the Lord has given you. Understand what the Lord has brought you into. He says, whereby are given unto us, every one of us, exceedingly great and precious promises. As you look at the Bible, you look at the promises that the Lord has given us. And then you know uh, they, they are exceedingly great, great promises in Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30, you will see that he had been given the promise for a long time. And through these exceedingly great and precious promises, then you will become partakers of the divine nature. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed. To love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. That's a great promise of God. That's a precious promise of God. When you read that verse, and you read it over again, and you analyze it and interpret it yourself, 
and you read it on your knees and you say, Lord, circumcising my heart, removing the hardness of my heart, the sin that coats, the sin that uh, superficially covers my heart, the sin that makes me to have a stony heart and the sin that is not making my life pleasing unto you because the root of life and the issues of life they come from the heart if my heart is not perfect my actions will not be perfect and my actions will not be pleasing unto god oh lord what is it in my heart you need to circumcise the first skin of my heart and take it away here is your promise is when you deliberate on it you meditate on it you chew it and you analyze it and you are you apply it to yourself and you read it on your knees and pray about it that's when you will have it and then by that great exceeding promise of the lord then you will be sanctified it is when you know that that it is by those promises you will be partakers of the divine nature in ezekiel chapter 11 Ezekiel chapter 11, reading there in verse 19. Ezekiel eleven nineteen, And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and will take the stony heart out of, your, out of their flesh, and will give them an heart of flesh, exceeding precious and great promises, that by those promises, exceedingly precious, exceedingly great, will become partakers of the divine nature. In Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36, reading verse 25 and verse 26, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. That's a promise from the Lord. He cannot say what he, he will not have said, what he will not do. And then in verse 26, a new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. I will give you an heart of flesh. When we talk about a promise, a promise is an assurance from, from someone of doing or giving us something very good and beneficial for us. It implies, number one, the sin that is promise, promising is in his power. He can do it. Number two, that he is willing to bestow that sin upon us. Number three, that it's a favor which we can obtain from him. And you, you see all the promises I've been reading to you. And these promises, they are the exceedingly great, exceedingly precious promises of God that make us to become partakers of the divine nature in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, and we're still looking at this uh, promise of the Lord that has given us. If it is not ours, it's because we didn't claim them. It's because we didn't treat them. It's because we didn't understand them. It's because we didn't appropriate them to be for ourselves. In Luke chapter 1, reading there from verse 70, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since, uh, the, since the world began, that we shall be saved, here are the promises now, we shall be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember a holy covenant. And then in verse 74 it says that he will grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. That's the promise of the Lord. Again, read the promise. Get on your knees and open the Bible. And pray through the promises. Take them one by one. And then say, Lord, this is your promise. And then get the promise back to him. Just like uh, you take your check, uh, uh, the, the check, you take it to the bank. Uh, somebody has given a promissory note. And then you take it there. You have to catch it. The same way you take the promises of the Lord back to the Lord. You said you will grant us that will be delivered. From the hand of our enemies that we might serve him without fear. And then it says, in holiness and righteousness before him. All the days of our life. That's the promise. And he has the power to do it. You know God has power to do anything that he wants to do. And he has promised that he will do it. But then we have a part to play. In Second Corinthians chapter 7. Second Corinthians chapter 7. I'm reading there from verse 1. It says, having these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness and of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. It says, uh, you see the promises of the Lord, having all these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves, 
Let's do whatever we can do. Let's avoid anything which is not of God. You have a part to play. You know there are people that feel well and the promises of God are there. When the Lord is ready, he will do what he has part to do or what he wants to do in my life and with my life. No, you have a part to play. He says, having these promises dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all the filthiness of the flesh and even of the spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. You have a part to play. Here is the imperative. Here is the commandment the Lord has given to you. That the promises of God will not just be yours if you do not play your part. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And then here comes now the promise and the fulfillment of the promise. And the very God of peace sanctify you holy and i pray god your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our lord jesus christ faithfully see that call it to you who also will do it and they are all reminding us he has called us and he has a purpose for calling us he called us so that we can be partakers of his glory Partakers of his virtue, partakers of his holiness. Again, please understand that all these things will come through the knowledge of him that called us. Please come to Second Peter chapter 1 in verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through laws. There's corruption in the world. There's defilement in the world. There's pollution in the world. Everything they do, as you look at all the things they do, their lifestyle, the things they eat, and the things they drink, and the way they marry, and the way they name their children, and the way they go about their business, and the fraud, and the bribe, everything. There's pollution in the world. It says, when we claim the promises of the Lord, we escape the corruption that's in the world through laws. And then it says we become partakers of the divine nature. If you will come to the Lord and come with faith and say, yes, I know. Since the Lord has promised, I know that I can possess what he has given. God has the power to make me righteous and to make me holy. He has the power to rescue me from the death of degradation and sin. And to make me possess a the undefiling and the purifying nature of the Lord. So that all the influence of the corruption and the pollution of the world will not have any effect on me. I can become a partaker of the divine nature, a partaker of the holiness of the Lord. When you come to the Lord like that, and you come with faith, and you come saying, O oh Lord, do it for me, then the Lord will do it for you. Already it says, grace and peace will multiplied unto you, by through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. And according to his divine power, he has given us already. Not that you will give. He has given us already. You are the one that has not claimed it. All things pertaining to life and godliness. And then it says, through these exceedingly great and precious promises, you can now be partakers of the divine nature. Why don't you rise up and say, Lord, I've been missing it a long time. I will not miss it today. I want that divine nature. I want to escape the corruption that's in the world through lust. I want the grace of God to multiply in my life. I want the peace of God to multiply in my life. All those things were provided pertaining to life eternal, pertaining to godliness, pertaining to righteousness, sanctification, and holiness. I want it for my life. He will do it. He will do it. Because he has promised that he will do it even to the very end of the world. You have the privilege you can come to the Lord now. You have the privilege you can call upon the Lord. If you have not been saved, when are you going to be saved? If you claim to be born again, you claim to be saved, but the, new, the transformation is not there. The new life is not there. The righteousness is not there. When are you going to become righteous? It's available. He has given it to you. When are you going to claim it? When are you going to possess it? If you have not been sanctified, if you have not been purified, if the Adamic nature has not been taken away, if the stony heart has not been taken away, if you are not perfecting holiness in the fear of God, if he has not purified your heart, purified your spirit, and purified you totally within and without, when is it going to happen? 
because he has given us these exceedingly great promises that we may become partakers of the divine nature. Why don't you tell him like Jacob, I will not let you go except to save me. I will not let you go except to sanctify me and make me holy.